Let's talk about some of the big disruptors in travel. We've long known, the industry has long known about the ambitions of Google and the travel industry, but it seems like this quarter we really got to see the pain that Google is starting to inflict on earnings of some of the major travel operators. Booking fared better than some of the others, but still your stock is down 10% in the month of November. Expedia is down 30%. What's happening here? Well, look, we were very happy with our third quarter numbers. You know, we came in 11% up year over year on our room night growth. That was better than the street expected. Earnings per share, we came in at 20% adjusted EPS. That's really good numbers. We're happy what's going on. We like what we're doing. Some of our competitors may have had a little bit of a hiccup. Certainly, they may depend more on Google than we do. One of the things that's very important for us is getting people to come to us direct. By providing a better service, something that really is something that customers want, we're able to have them come direct. And if people are depending on other things, Google or anywhere else, that could have been their issue. But let's address the role that Google is playing. I mean, given the emergence of this big technology player in travel, is more consolidation likely in the online travel space? You've already bought Kayak, OpenTable, among a number of other companies. Yeah, we built our company by doing acquisitions, and we're always looking for what may fit, what may be good. May be good. The truth of the matter is, though, whether you're a big player or a small player, you've got to provide a great service. And if you can do it by buying another company, more consolidation, that's great. We're also doing a lot of things organically that's really putting together what we call the connected trip, providing all the services, not just hotels anymore for us. And we now have flights going. We've got our open table, as you mentioned, doing restaurants. We've got attractions. We've got rental cars. We're putting together something that's going to be so much better that people will say, hey, when I want to do travel, I come to Booking.com. The decline we've seen in room races, does that, the decline we've seen in room rates, does that uh, suggest softness in the consumer, the consumer pulling back on travel? Well, our numbers we don't see as being very soft. 11% year over year is pretty good at our size. You know, we are the biggest player in the travel industry in terms of room nights. So we're pleased with that number. Now, there are some areas of softness, and I've talked about that. Look, you see things happening in the U.S. and China. That impacts China's economy. That impacts China travel. And China outbound to the U.S. is actually down year over year. That's a surprise. Or look on TV. You see things happening in Hong Kong. Not a lot of people are going to Hong Kong. Germany, soft economy there. That all sluggishness there, that impacts. But overall, travel's healthy, and we're pleased with what's happening. John Ford has a question back in the studio. Hi, Glenn. I just heard you mention Hong Kong, and I believe you mentioned before uh, when talking about room rates being a bit soft that, that Hong Kong was an area. I'm hoping you can give us some sense what's happening there. Are uh, hotels discounting in Hong Kong to, to try to drive people back there? How is traffic, and is that affecting the rest of Asia? Yeah. Uh, seeing what's happening in Hong Kong, you have a lot of people saying, gee, I'm not sure I want to travel to Hong Kong right now. And when you have occupancy rates of a hotel go down, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to start cutting rates, trying to attract people to come. And as those uh, rates go down, some people may say, well, it's a good time to travel. Other people say, you know, I just don't know if I want to go there or not. But certainly that's a way that hotels are always going to try and get more demand by dropping rate. Airbnb gearing up to go public next year, Glenn. How does that affect the way you try to uh, gain market share in the short-term rental space? Well, that's an area we've been concentrating on for a long time. You know, our first apartments was more than 15 years ago. So we've been in this business for some time. We're very pleased. We have 6.2 million listings in what we call the alternative accommodations, which is what goes against Airbnb. Like, I'm really pleased with the way we do the business, being able to show both a home, an apartment, a villa, and a hotel on the same search result. Because most times when you come to a site deciding, what do I want to stay, where do I want to go, you don't really know. you got to look at all the different options, look at the prices, look at the reviews. We offer all of that in one place. And what's really important, we don't at the end of the uh, funnel, where at the end you're ready to check out, we don't hit you with a traveler's fee. That's something our competitors do. We don't do that. Also, instant confirmation. Nothing more annoying than if you go to a site and you have to go back and forth, back and forth with the host, and then the person says to you, oh, I don't want to rent it to you. You just wasted all that time. Booking.com, every single property, instant confirmation. You press go and you're done. Morgan has a question back in the studio. I do. Thanks, Seema. Glenn, hi. Uh, sticking with this part of the business, we've seen a reining in, in some cases even just a crackdown from a regulatory standpoint in many cities around the country and around the world on home sharing. Jersey City here being probably the most high-profile recent example of it. How are you navigating that? 
Yeah, no, that is an important issue. And we've always believed that proper regulation is the way to go. You have a lot of stakeholders. It's not just the hosts. It's not just the travelers. It's not just us being that platform for both of them. It's also the communities. And taxes. You want people to be paying appropriate taxes for any type of accommodation. So it definitely is something that we agree. We work with those regulators. We want to come up with something that is fair and equal for everybody. As long as there's a playing field that is level for everyone, we're all in favor of it. You're one of the more disruptor, uh, disruptive players in the online travel space, Glenn. You're not only an online travel company, the largest of them all, but you have investments in China. You also were one of the initial backers of Facebook's Libra, its stablecoin. Three weeks ago, you pulled out. Why? Well, look, we always say that we want to be involved in things that we think can be better for our industry. One of the things we lower the cost of transferring money around. We have a lot of payments that are going around between a customer who wants to stay somewhere and then there's a host who has to get paid. There are lots of different ways to get that money from one place to the other. We were definitely interested in looking at that, so we said, sure, we'll look at it. And having looked at it a bit and having seen where things were going, we decided, you know, maybe for us, we'll just pull back and wait and see what happens because most important is that the regulators have to be comfortable with whatever comes up is good for everyone. So if the regulators approve that Libra stable coin, we'd be very much in favor of being part of it. Or if something else, you know, one of the things you probably saw is that China is developing their own stable coin. That's coming from the government under the People's Bank of China. They're developing that. And there's an announcement in Europe a few days ago where the European regulators say, you know, they should come up with their own stable coin too. Look, I believe in the future using some type of blockchain way to transfer money around is going to be a better, more efficient, easier way to do it. But we need to come up with something that is good, that is safe. We can deal with the privacy issues, all the things you want to do with any type of financial So there's a chance you may go back and support Facebook with its Libra if, ambitions or again, another company. Or not, if, if the regulators approve it, we'd be very much in favor of being a participant in any type of new way to do financial transactions. John, back in the studio. Uh, Glenn, I, I want to better understand your digital advertising strategy. I believe in Q2, brand marketing uh, for you guys was up 41%. You said that was to drive direct traffic, uh, which is important to you. In the most recent quarter, it was down 23%. So I, I know that you're saying that direct traffic is important. Do you no longer need that brand marketing to drive that traffic? Are you just sort of managing the, the comps year over year? What's going on? Well, look, brand marketing is an important leg of any marketing table. You want to have that. And year over year for 2019 over 2018, we are up. Now, you're right. In the last quarter, we were a little bit lower than we were the year before. And I made that point both in the current uh, call and the call before that while we had new campaigns out that I thought were doing well, there were some areas I wasn't pleased with. And overall, it was OK. We have a new CMO at Booking.com. I'm very pleased that he's come in. He's been only for a few months. We're going to work with some new things, see what can come back, and then come back with something we think would be even better. But we are not stopping brand marketing. But our company was built on experimentation. If things don't work, we're more than willing to pull back, go back to the drawing board, come up with something better, and go back at it. Morgan. Glenn, a lot of focus on the state of the consumer, health of the consumer this week, especially as investors digest retail earnings that have been a mixed bag. How would you describe the health of the consumer right now, especially given the fact that there have been some headwinds uh, in terms of global travel this year? Well, again, I'll divide between global and U.S. domestic. So globally, I say it's healthy with some pockets of problems. The U.S., I'd say, is a little bit better right now. And the way I look at these things is look at occupancy rates in hotels, they're up, they're good. Look at load factors on planes. Planes are filled. Look at some of what the airlines have been putting out in terms of the number of people they're filling uh, on their planes. Those are good numbers. So generally, I'd say it's pretty healthy right now. The travel industry is weathering many storms, as you pointed out, Glenn, from the Hong Kong protests to hurricanes. But right now, as we head into a new year or close out 2019, what's the biggest risk you see right now? Well, look, there are so many risks, and I, I go to sleep thinking about all of them all the time. But one of the benefits, no matter what the risk is, your point about long term, we've been through a lot. And you mentioned a couple that happened recently. I've been in this business now 20 years. We've had horrific problems all throughout from 2000 on, yet travel continues in the long run to grow. We're the biggest player in the industry. So we can afford any type there's a dip, we can invest. We can come up with new things. We're able to spread our expenses across a much larger base, and therefore we have an advantage over almost anybody in the space.